So welcome to the Copper Coast virtual geology field trip. This field trip you can access through our website at www.coppercoastgeopark.com under the Discover the Geopark section. This field trip was created by us with funding from the Geological Survey of Ireland and help from UCC and is being launched as part of Science Week 2022 in association with the CalMAST STEM Outreach Centre at SETU. So to start, uh, as we start our field trip, we are hovering above the sea outside the village of Oman, and we will soon go through a series of 11 different stops that will show us three different geological sites, we call geosites, in the Copper Coast UNESCO Global Geopark. Each site is a series of 360 images that you can examine and interact with. There will be various different points of interest you can click on to learn more about. And I'll show you as well how to navigate through different locations, how to go back. As we are right now, which is a good place to start, we are looking directly at the coastline of the Copper Coast Geopark. We are looking at an area not far from the village of Oman, around Tanker Sound Engine House, which we can just about make out on our screen. And if we look to our left using mouse cursor or using your fingers on a touchscreen device, we can see all the way over to Helvick Head on the far left of our screen, which is off to the west and the Comer Mountains in the background to the north. Turning the other direction to the east, we can see Dunabratton Headland, and beyond it, we can actually even see the beaches at Kilfarisi and Garris, just zooming in there. So we're going to start this field trip. We're going to take a closer look at the cliffs underneath Tankerstown. Here we are very close to Tankerstown Engine House. And you can see a really varied variety of points of interest and an interesting cliff line. So let's go start from left to right on these points of interest. The cliffs here in general, first of all, show us some of the different rocks from the Ordovician era. When was that? That was 460 million years ago. During this time, the environment the Copper Coast was in was very, very different to the environment we see today. 460 million years ago, these rocks were created underneath an ocean by volcanic activity. So Imagine undersea volcanoes like we have today and fissures of magma coming up from this, the crust under the sea floor. We're going to look into a bit more detail about those later on in our field trip. There's a few things that are worth pointing out here. This yellow colored rock we see in front of us here is an example of rhyolite. Clicking on this will tell you a little bit about it, but to summarize, it's a magma that comes from an explosive kind of eruption. It's extrusive, so that means it comes out over or very close to the Earth's crust. And it's here, all these rocks are part of the area's bedrock. What bedrock is, is the solid cohesive layer of rock that's underneath the layers of subsoil and soil. And if I click on this, it will show a diagram that shows where the bedrock is lies beneath the different layers that make up the ground underneath our feet in a typical environment. In some places in Ireland, for example, in the Burren, the bedrock is exposed on the surface. There is often sometimes no soil on top of it. Whereas in other areas, such as the Irish Midlands, the bedrock is buried under tens of 
feet and sometimes meters of subsoil and soil. Coastal areas like this are always great places to see bedrock because it is exposed through the weathering action of the waves and wind and other forces of coastal erosion. We can click on this map icon down here to see a map of the different kinds of bedrock around the Copper Coast. I'm not going to go into too much detail in this map, but it helps to remember that all the different colors, each of the different colors, is a different rock type. So the first impression you can get from looking at that is there is a variety of rock types in the Copper Coast. However, there is two kind dominant types, well, two dominant types of volcanic rock, rocks formed from volcanoes, and also some sedimentary rocks. As we go to the east of the Copper Coast, from roughly where we are around here, over as far uh, as Garris Beach, the kind of volcanic rock is more or less that rhyolitic type that we saw in the cliff here. And to our left, the rock type changes into a darker kind of volcanic rock uh, mapped here as the Bunman Formation, which is a rock called andesite or similar mafic or dark colored volcanic rocks. This red outline shows the overall outline of the geopark. And as well as those two dominant rock types, we can see some, some other colors here representing different types of volcanic rocks and also some sedimentary rocks. And just to give a brief recap on what the difference between sedimentary and volcanic rocks is. Sedimentary rocks are those that form from weathering action of other rocks, such as the accumulation of sand grains or of the remains of sea creatures. And volcanic rocks are those created by magma or the eruption or the intrusion or extrusion of volcanic material. Um, there's a third type of rock called metamorphic rocks, which are when one of those other two types, sedimentary or volcanic, is transformed into another kind of rock. So looking at this coastline, another feature that's worth noting is, as well as the geology, the very, very old rock formations is the modern actions of erosion that are taking place today. So if we zoom in here, we can see a recent rockfall created likely due to a combination of rain eroding the cliff above, as well as the impact of waves and stormy weather. Uh, you can see as well different patches where there's green growing on the cliffs and where the cliffs are totally barren. That indicates that the cliff face is inactive or active. What that means is that in some places, erosion is happening. And where there's erosion, there's no vegetation on the cliff. Where there's less erosion, vegetation is able to take hold. So we can look at this cliff line and we can see all different areas where there's either active erosion or the cliff is relatively inactive. Zooming out a little bit and looking over here, we can see a sea stack, which is a feature created by coastal erosion. The sea stack would have at one point been connected to this cliff face, but it was separated due to like, the same erosive features. Uh, all around this bedrock, was likely at some point part of the cliff as well as these sea stacks. One last thing we can click on here is an image which shows us a panorama created in the 19th century of the area that we're looking at. I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about the mining history later on, but I guess it just gives us a little sense of the history that is here too. So now, we're going to take a closer look at this cliff face and see what else we can learn. Okay, we're hovering above the beach now. 
and we're going to go examine the features here from left to right. As we look over to the left towards the east, we have to zoom in a little bit, but this area down here near where stage cove is today marks a fault zone. What that means is the rocks to the left are different than the rocks to the right. It, this area was actually where the initial mining activity happened in the Copper Coast at the beginning of the 19th century, which we'll talk about more later. Um, but it is interesting to note that there is a rock type here, which is sedimentary in nature, a limestone, or more like a limey mudstone, which is then runs up against faults contact with volcanic rhyolite. And these rhyolites down here have a particularly interesting feature. We're going to click on them to find out more. They are what's known as columnar rhyolites. Columnar rhyolites are familiar. The formation of columnar rhyolites is similar to the same method that created the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland, except these rocks are probably 10 times older than the rocks in the Giant's Causeway. To create these distinctive column shapes, the water cools the magma at strange or at varying rates, causing it to shrink inwards and to contract at angles to the cooling act of the seawater surrounding it. And this is a great example of this feature in the Copper Coast. Unfortunately, it is highly fractured and is eroding really, really fast, as we can see by these piles of scree and rock down at the base of the cliff. So it's not often that you will get a very good indication of this feature by actually looking at it. Uh, as we move to the right, we can see the really distorted versions of the same volcanic rocks, as well as some mysterious holes in the cliff in a line here. We're going to have a little zoom in and look. These holes, which run in a straight line, are actually man-made. They are mine shafts, horizontal mine shafts that are known as adits, which usually link into a central vertical shaft, which will be up here somewhere. And these were created during that mining era in the 19th century to extract copper ore from these rocks. And a little bit about that copper ore, the same kind of copper ore was mined here as down here earlier. The mine here went from about 1825 to 1840. And here mining began about 1848. The miners looked for quartz veins or lines of the mineral quartz which were rich in copper in the rock which in a copper mineral known as chalcopyrite which is copper sulfide and they blew these holes in the rock in order to get the mineral out and to allow themselves access to the vein I have a little flashing ticker here on the right, which tells us a bit more about that extrusive nature of the volcanic rocks, as well as a timeline. I'm going to click on this and we're going to see what the Copper Coast looked like when these cliffs formed. So this bottom image here, 460 million years ago, shows Southeast Ireland and Northwest Ireland as two separate parts of two separate continental plates separated by an ocean, the same ocean that I was talking a minute ago, that all these rocks extruded into the floor of. These two parts of Ireland were gradually brought together as this ocean closed. And this closed because the same tectonic forces we see today, which separate our continents and bring them together um, have been working in different ways throughout geological time and they have brought together and pulled apart continents continuously over hundreds of millions of years and all of these 
rocks we see here were created by the volcanic activity that resulted from that act of closing 460 to around 450 million years ago. So now we're going to go and now that we know a little bit more about the kind of environments that were represented here, we're going to go to Tankerstown Engine House and see some evidence of how humans exploited the minerals that were resulted from this environment. Now, if we look down to our right, we can see that we're hovering just above Tankerstown Engine House, which is a really iconic building familiar to anyone who's visited the coast. As we look down directly beneath us, we can see this building marked Engine House and this square structure here surrounded by varying degrees of fencing known as Heron Shaft. I'm gonna just click here to show you what you're seeing now versus what it was roughly 170 years ago. This is a sketch of the same buildings you can see now from that time. The building in front of you housed a steam engine, the a large steam engine, which was used to drain water out of the mines that miners created below. The building on the left was a home to another steam engine that was used to power machinery that both brought miners up and down out of the mines and also pulled these pulled trolleys on a railway down to the village of Baman, which contained ore to be sorted and filtered. The shaft as well, you can see here, uh, goes down under Heron shaft and is over 250 meters deep. This mine shaft actually continues diagonally out to sea and goes underneath the seabed itself. But it's not the only mine shaft we have here. This area is actually home to hundreds of mine shafts, many of which are mapped, but also many of which are unmapped and unknown. If we look inland here, I've marked one of them on this map, which has been fenced off which is a mine shaft, which is on a line with this engine house. And beneath here, we, we have ranges of adits. Um, to understand why it's in a line, we have to understand that the copper occurs in and along faults, which are effectively breaks in the rocks, which represent two, one or two different rock types coming together. And that change in the rock structure allows mineral rich fluid to enter and create mineral deposits of the calcopyrite copper ore. I'm just going to show you a map, just illustrates the mining complex. So where we are now in Tankerstown on the right, we can see the main shaft and also this red shaft marked in here. These are just some of the main and known mine shafts. And this trackway represents that, that railway, which carried trams down into Nokman in the village of Baman, where the ores were sorted in a dressing floor outlined in blue. Stage Cove, where we're gonna to go to next, was the original mining location on the Copper Coast, or at least during this period of mining in the 19th century. And that was also where the ore was shipped from. So this was from roughly, well, this area from roughly 1825 until about 1875, 76, span of around 50 years. This area was a very industrial zone with two steam engines running all the time, a railway, a miniature railway, which ran along the cliff here. And if we, you can't see it very well from here, 
but we can just about make out the dent in or the hollow in the cliff where it would have ran down the road here or along where the road is today down into Bauman. Um, if you want to, you can watch a video tour of this engine house, but overground and underground, but I'm not going to do that today. And right now you can stop the video here and do that at your own time. But for now, we're going to go to Stagecove. So Stagecove has got a number of different features that are interesting to us. Firstly, we'll look at the rocks. We can see that this bluey green rock all around this cliff, that's that andesitic, that andesite mineral or that andesite rock type that is a slightly darker magma, whereas that light grained or light colored rock that we saw on the other side of these cliffs, rhyolite, comes from a more explosive style of eruption. This andesite is a result of a slower, more treacly kind of magma, more from an earlier time period. As well as the rocks, the geology of these rocks, we can also see lots of those holes in the rocks, these adits, which are everywhere in these cliffs, these horizontal shafts, which link up into mine shafts. And we can see actually the edges of a fence, which fences off one of them, but they are everywhere in this cliff line. However, as well as the geology and the mining here, we also have some great outcrops. And I say outcrops are exposures or places where we can see geological features of ice age material. These soil here, the soil there, which very distinctly cuts the rock and can be seen up here as well. We can see a very distinct line, a red line here due to the likely erosion of some red sandstone, which would have been here at some point all along this cliff line. And that marks uh, the location where the subsoil, which is glacial subsoil, deposited during the last ice age. And here is a rough representation of how at the peak of a, those ice, that ice age period, which is between 2.4 million and 11,500 years, the entirety of Ireland and much of Northwest Britain was covered in a massive sheet of ice. However, there were periods called interglacial, per interglacial periods where the ice receded and areas were left in a tundra-like environment. However, 11,000, 12,000 years ago, the last of these glaciers melted and the melting action transported all this soil here because you have to remember that ice and glaciers, doesn't, glaciers don't stay still, they move constantly. As they move, they erode the surface beneath them and they pick up lots of material that they bring with them. So those melting glaciers took that material and transported it elsewhere as they melted. Another notable feature here is mineral staining. Just about make this out on this image, but there's a greeny blue color on the cliff line here. You can see it on the wall as well, or on the slipway here. The it's more pronounced in heavy rain, periods of heavy rain, but when this image was taken, it had been very dry. This is a kind of mineral, which is actually created when water, rainwater, in this case, interacts with ore, copper ore, calcopyrite ore in the cliffs and forms a different kind of mineral. And here is a close up of what that looks like. We can see the different greens and blues. The greens and blues are actually minerals called at, like atacamite, langite, uh, conellite, and they form in a kind of a silica gel. The color depends on the chemistry of the water and the exact mineral composition they interact with. 
they're very rich in copper. And if you were to concentrate these over a long period of time, you would get some very beautiful minerals such as malachite, which form over thousands and tens of thousands of years. This area also is notable because the slipway was constructed during the mining era in order for the miners to ship the ore from here. After the ore was mined in Tankerstown, it was brought down to the village of Oman to be dressed on the dressing floor. That means the waste ore was sorted from the good ore, from the clean ore. And that copper ore was then brought up here to be staged where, and then small rowboats would take this ore from this slipway out to ships, which would be anchored further out to sea because there was no really very good anchorage on this part of the coast. There was nowhere for large ships to come into land or ports. I can show you another diorama. It's the same one actually we saw earlier that shows the kind of activity that would have been in terms of sailing ships during the 19th century. We can also see some other engine houses as well. And you can imagine that there would have been a lot of marine maritime transport. All the coal for the steam engines had to be shipped in and out or shipped in, the ore had to be shipped out. All supplies for the miners would have been brought in by sea as well, because at this time, this area was relatively isolated from the rest of the world. So this is, we're now going to leave this first stop on our, or this first geo site, which is the area around Tankerstown and Stage Cove. And we're going to go to Tronovo, which is a small cove on the other side of the village of Oman, the eastern side. And we can see some more geological features there and also some more evidence of the mining works on the Copper Coast. So let's go there now. We zoom out a little bit. This just gives us an overview of the site at Tronovo, as well as to the left of Tronovo, another beach called Tronestrella. But today we're going to be focusing on Tronovo. I've labeled pretty clearly two different rock types here. And this beach shows very good examples of unconformities, faulting, as well as some great volcanic features. In simple terms, this shows two very different rock types right beside each other that should not have been in the same elevation and the same place based on the order they naturally formed in, but they were put there by forces, by Earth's forces afterwards. So I think we should go and have a closer look and see what we can learn about them. We're going to start off on the west side of the cove, and we're going to take a close look at this red colored rock over here. Actually, one thing to note, first of all, is often when we look at rocks, we see a particular surface. In this case, we see this black surface here, which is a weathered surface. It's, a, it's not the actual color or material or texture of the rock. It's the effect created by algae and mosses and other forms of weathering that change, but we can see some clean or unweathered out examples just at the base here where the water has been interacting with the rock. And you can see a red, fine grained red sandstone in some parts of this cliff. And in other parts, we can make out just about some coarser material, which has got larger clasts of rock clumped together, kind of like a cement over here. These are conglomerates and these are sandstones. And we can see a nice little sea cave in the middle here. The important thing to note here is that while the rocks that we looked about looked at earlier were from a time period that is the rocks from this era, these rocks are 
from the Devonian period, which began around 420 million years ago, but these rocks in particular are around 390 million years old. There's, that means they're still extremely old, but they're much younger than the 460 million year old rocks we just saw. And they were created in a completely different environment. The probably the biggest difference is they were actually created on land. Whereas those previous rocks were formed underwater. These rocks were created in, in desert ish environment, sort of a area where there was very little regular rainfall, but occasional heavy stream rainfall or heavy rainfall, which created rivers, kind of braided river systems like we see today. And these rocks were the result of the sediments deposited in that kind of a system. And in that system, sometimes the water was the water energy, energy of deposition. These are sedimentary rocks was very high and coarser grain material was deposited. And sometimes the energy was lower and the rock types were finer grained with less energy to carry and deposit the grains. As well as that, it's worth noting that these, like any river system, it's difficult to make out here, but the, there are multiple features that indicate in these, in this outcrop that the direction of formation was this way. In other words, this was down to the right and the rocks were laid down perpendicular to this location. But obviously rivers don't flow sideways. So the actual orientation was initially horizontal. So how did it, this outcrop go from horizontal to vertical, almost vertical at an 80 degree angle? The vertical orientation that we see in these rocks today is the result of a tectonic shift that took place around 300 and 30 million years ago during the Variscan period, during a different period, these rocks at the same time, the Comer mountains were created. These rocks were down thrown. They were forced downwards from a higher elevation because these are the same rock types that make up the Comer mountains. We're going to see more examples of these at our next geosite. They were down thrown into their current arrangement. And as a result, they were put into contact with these far older volcanic rocks that we saw previously, and we can see some great examples of here. So as we move left, remembering that these are sedimentary rocks on our right, we enter a volcanic environment. The difference between the two is marked quite dramatically by the sea stack, which stands here as a remainder of a softer rock type, which had been eroded away in the past. But to its left, there are all kinds, various different varieties of rock type from these light gray volcanic ash deposits to a quartz rich, lighter colored volcanic rock over here. And throughout them, there are these white quartz veins, some of which have those holes in them, those adits that we saw earlier on, similar features and similar reasons for them being there, because these once contained copper ore, or at least enough evidence of copper ore or to be worthwhile exploring. This fault, but this fault, which marks the gap is in this pathway that we see here represented covered in this grass. And this volcanic environment was all the result of that same undersea volcanic activity that we saw earlier on. 
his rocks are predominantly predominantly andesite type rocks they are that formed from that same treacly magma we talked about in the last stop at stage cove and they make up the entirety of the cliffs here so we can click on this image here to learn more about quartz veins and the kind of faults that they occur in and we're now going to go a little bit further along the beach to the west to learn a bit more about these volcanic features and what we can see and if you look down as well you'll see a little place map that shows us where we are on the coastline which is our location marked in red and we just came from this area to the right of the map which was close to tanker sound engine house so let's go here so at this stop we can see looking back that clearly marked out that fault line from those old younger Devonian sandstone sedimentary rocks and those much older Ordovician volcanic rocks formed in an undersea environment. Two completely different time periods, two completely different environments brought side by side through a massive tectonic event hundreds of millions of years ago. And as we go left, we see more examples of adits and over here, we can see some interesting volcanic and tectonic features. On the top here, we can click and learn more about some quartz veins that are deformed in an unusual way in these rocks. They are what's known as shear veins, which tell us how these rocks were moved after being formed. They're the way that they're bent in the rock is in reaction to the stress that was placed upon them by events like earthquakes and shows how the rocks were moved after being formed. Beneath them, uh, if we click on this feature, this image of a volcano, we can learn about a sequence that you can see here in this photo, which is a snapshot of a volcanic eruption coming up from the sea floor and into the sea and then falling back down again as ash. The sill, which would be presumably located underneath the sand here, would be a solid, solid andesite block, which is the andesite intruding into the sea, into the crust beneath the sea. And then as the magma comes up into the cold seawater or sorry the cold sediments beneath the sea sands and muds the magma forms clasts which are marked here as pepperites which are little clumps of the andesite magma surrounded by the remains of the seabed at the time which was turned into rock into a fine-grained crystalline rock and then as the eruption continued and went above the through the sea floor it erupted into the water and the ash fell down into layers layers of tuff that we can see in this rock today so it shows us exactly how this environment was a little snapshot of that time 460 million years ago when the magma came up through an ancient ocean floor into the seawater and came down again as layers of volcanic ash it's also worth noting the dramatic coastal erosion we have here with the cliff lines being undercut by wave action and forming wave cut platforms and again the vegetation which indicates the active and inactive parts of the cliff line here. So that's the end of our second geological site. We're now going to move on to our third and final geosite, where we're going to see more of this Devonian rock 
and the unconformity with the Ordovician rocks, which dominate this coast, as well as some evidence of an earlier period of mining. Let's go there now. So in this image, we get a good overview of the beach at Ballyduan, which is about two or maybe three kilometers further west from our last stop. We can see in the map beneath us, our location marked in red with the location of the previous two geological sites in green. Looking towards the beach, the first thing we see is a dramatic cliff line with these stunning red sandstone cliffs. And if you look closely, you can see in the corner of this cliff line, a different rock type or a different color rock, which is coming into direct contact with the rock beside us. But first we're gonna go have a look at this sea stack over here and see if there's anything interesting there. Turning around, we can look and into the sea stack and see a hole in it. This is actually a man-made feature and is in fact a mine shaft. This mine shaft is around 100 years older than the mine shafts that we saw previously. And it's from an earlier period of mining that we know very little about from the 17th century when this area was part of a complex mined or a mining industry owned by a Waterford merchant called Thomas Wise, who produced copper and silver and lead from this area. Uh, we presume that it links to further mine shafts located inland and is related structurally from a geological point of view, with that same faulting, fault controlled type of mineral deposits that we saw in the rest of the coast. And looking back towards the cliff, we can see that red sandstone in a bit more detail, as well as that contrast between the red sandstone and conglomerate, those sedimentary Devonian rocks, and the lighter colored, but much older Ordovician volcanic andesite. So for our final stop in our tour, let's have a little look at those. Now we are up close with this feature and there's lots to click on and look at, but it helps just to take it in for a second and see the dramatic contrast. I've just drawn a line here to illustrate it, but I don't think the line is even really necessary. Where this environment, which I represented with a desert, more accurately would be a braided river system, is coming into unconformable contact, i.e. it doesn't conform to the correct logic of the formation, i.e. we assume in geology that younger rocks will become wood in a perfectly undisturbed environment, be progressively layered on top of older rocks with the youngest on top, the oldest on the bottom of the record and the intermediate layers sorted based on age from oldest to youngest. But instead it is brought into direct contact with a period, an environment almost 70 million years older than it and from a totally different setting, which again shows us evidence of that deformation event, which took place during the Variscan period. And clicking on both of these will bring up some icons and some information that show us the kinds of environments. This is a modern day braided river system, similar to the environment in which these sediments were created. And what's interesting here is it's difficult to make out in this image, but the some of the conglomerate, some of the conglomerate, which rocks here have clumps of this rock in it, which show that the erosion brought those two together. As we move, look to our right, 
we can see again that mine shaft and we can see over here in the distance there is a headland which has got some very good examples of those glacial sediments like the ones we looked at in stage cove earlier this sequence here shows us that contact with the glacial subsoil and that sedimentary rock just sharp sharp eroding surface where all the other rocks the hundreds of millions of years of earth's history that would have sat on top of these has been wiped away by the glaciers acting almost like sandpaper on a very soft green wood so that concludes our tour today um this has been quite a whistle stop geology field trip but i encourage you to go back through the tour and interact with all the elements so you can learn more about these features i can just go back to the tour by just clicking right on my keyboard and i just want to thank you very much for listening to me so far and for enjoying i hope you enjoyed this tour and you can learn more about it and the copper coast geology on our website coppercoastgeopark.com